Welcome to the Representation Projects in Rape Campaign Expert Interview Series. Uh, this is a campaign that is focused on understanding the root causes and consequences of sexual violence in the US, um, as well as globally, with the ultimate goal of uh, reducing and eliminating gender-based and sexual violence. I just want to say uh, that if you are a survivor and you are a trauma survivor and you're triggered or activated by sexual violence as a topic, uh, we will definitely be discussing difficult topics today. So perhaps um, watch this video when it is available later and watch it on your own time uh, if you feel yourself getting activated. Um, I am delighted to welcome renowned scholar, Dr. Earl Smith. Um, I've been uh, using Dr. Smith's work for many years and let me read you uh, a bio that does not do him justice, uh, but it'll give you a sense of the scope and depth of his work. Uh, Dr. Smith is Emeritus Distinguished Professor of American Ethnic Studies and Sociology at Wake Forest University and is currently teaching classes in sociology, African and African-American studies studies and women and gender studies at the University of Delaware. His teaching and his research focus on the sociology of sport, social stratification, criminal justice, and race. He has authored 12 books, including a few recent books, uh, Gender, Power, and Violence, and Policing Black Bodies. His uh, very popular book, Race, Sport, and the American Dream, has been published in three editions, and it remains the only book on the market that examines structural racism in the sports world. On a regular basis, he is consulted as an expert by the New York Times, USA Today, and a variety of other prominent news outlets. Dr. Smith teaches courses on social stratification, race and ethnicity, social problems, race and gender, and sexuality and sports. So welcome to our expert interview series, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you. And let's jump right in. Um, and just before we jump in, yes, this will be recorded and available later. Also, you will get an opportunity to ask Dr. Smith questions directly. Just put them in the Q&A at any point during our interview. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Earl Smith some questions for about 25 minutes back and forth, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So please have them ready and again, drop them in at any point. Um, Dr. Smith, let's get started. Uh, tell us about your work and your life plan. When and how did you know that you wanted to work on issues of race, gender, sports, and sexual violence? Violence. And I ask this because it's a pretty unusual combination of topics for an academic. Yeah, I like to, to tell this little story um, as it relates to that question. Um, I had uh, gotten a position, tenure track position at SUNY State University of New York at Brockport. And I don't know, luck would have it. I bumped into a young man who may have just received his PhD or um, similar to myself was new as a PhD scholar. And he was doing an adjunct uh, position at SUNY Brockport. I was tenure track at SUNY Brockport. And um, we bumped into each other and somehow said, hey, you know, can you come to my class, uh, give a little talk? You're telling me about this sports stuff. Uh, I had not known of it or paid attention to it. And uh, Don Sabo, who uh, has done a lot of work in the area of um, violence in sport, uh, passed over to me. I can't remember exactly. I think it was a paper. It could have been his, his book on pigs pigskin patriarchy. And I'm thinking, what the heck is this? Um, had no interest, uh, had myself been involved in some sporting activities in, in high school, but I didn't think any of that fit into academic curriculum. Well, it also turns out that Don was doing his dissertation with my next door neighbor. I mean, we literally had a creek that ran between my property and theirs. And this was a, 
SUNY Buffalo professor by the name of Michael Farrell. And just like, oh my gosh, Mike says, why don't you come over? We'll have, you know, maybe some drinks and you can talk more with Don. And that's literally how I got into this sociology of sport um, piece, which wasn't welcome at SUNY Brockport or several other institutions where I taught. It was seen as a, you know, sort of a frivolous kind of um, activity, but not fitting into the, you know, the deep, deep, deep curriculum of American sociology. So it, so it wasn't taken seriously, but I can tell you this, it's taken seriously now. Um, you don't find most departments that don't have some aspect of sport. So that, that, that's how it happened. And I'm glad it happened. Isn't it funny how our, you know, we, we think of research as, and the goal of research, of course, is to uh, not be biased, right? To approach it uh, using the scientific method in order to reduce our biases. But the very fact of what we choose to study, um, introduce, it is a bias, right? We wanna study, we wanna know more about a thing. And, and we tend to think of it as very planful, but oftentimes it is, these serendipitous, you know, these these moments that we have with people that then inspire us, and of course, you have you initially were studying um, race and patriarchy in sports, and you work with uh, the Center for the Study of Prevention of Gender Based Violence. So you're heavily focused on gender based violence um, and sexual violence. Violence is a part of that in sport. Um, this is a long way of asking about kind of the culture of gender-based violence and sport. How would you describe that? What should people know the basics about that? Well, sports world, as we call it, is uh, highly segregated, highly segregated. And um, men, for the most part, uh, rule sports world. And when men and women have interactions in sports world, they're not equal. Uh, men and women don't play on the same uh, playing field. And um, even though it's sort of changed a little bit, uh, women were seen as uh, non-athletes. Uh, they were prevented in doing things like running past 800 meters, definitely not the marathon. And so there's all this history of women having to do extra to become full participants in the various sports that uh, uh, Americans play um, and, and, and regulated. I mean, even today, I can't be exactly sure, but even today, I think uh, in, in, in women's basketball, for example, the ball is smaller. Well, if anybody saw some of some of these women that play in the uh, WNBA, they don't need a small ball. Um, they they have the size, they have the definition, um, and so all of those kinds of things came at it. And one of the things we know was this culture was built around men. Uh, if you you know. You, if you've ever been, and we've had women sports reporters who have told us they have been in the locker room, this, this so-called sacred place, um, and have been mistreated. But if you've ever been in a, in a men's locker room, uh, this culture uh, spills out all over that place. Um, you know, I remember doing some research some years back, people were just men, athletes, were just really, really excited about uh, the late Wilt Chamberlain. And, you know, Wilt Chamberlain as a, as a, as a basketball player was, was at the top of the list. But today, when, when people talk about and think about what Wilt Chamberlain was doing in basketball, they also talk about his, his, his statements about uh, having sex with 20,000 women uh, across his basketball career. And, and, you know, I can see young males are really getting excited about that. Oh my gosh, you know, Will Chamberlain did all these things. Um, 
And then in this, in this culture, uh, men who abuse women are not held accountable. Uh, and so if we know on the back end that you're not going to be held accountable, then you don't worry about participating in this aberrant behavior. Uh, so, so many examples exist out there where people have even been convicted and still go out on the field uh, to play baseball or football or even now in the U.S. soccer. So the culture is... Um, heavily laid and layered with expensive lawyers. We always ask the question, where do, where do these young college students who on one hand tell you they don't have enough to, to eat, where do they get you know Fifth Avenue lawyers when there's some trouble and especially uh, sexual violence? It's, it's amazing, you know, how do you pay for these lawyers when you, telling us you can't buy a sandwich in, in the lunchroom. So the culture itself uh, sort of allows these behaviors to take place and these complicated um, legal uh, you know, encounters on campus with campus uh, uh, staff uh, adjudicating uh, what is really criminal activities and are not qualified to do so, but right in the thick of it. So the, the culture is lopsided uh, in, and it leans towards um, men and it leans towards athletes. Mm. So what I hear you saying is that this culture, the sports culture excludes women. Uh, yes. They face harassment when they're there. Uh, there's a celebration of women as sex objects which of course, when you reduce a group, you, you sexually objectify them. They become move from being a person to an object that you're, they're dehumanized. And so when we have uh, men who are acting on that dehumanization through sexual violence, that there's an actual system in place well before they get to the NBA or the NFL or MLB, there's a system in place even at the college level to protect them that this is a systemic issue. I mean, if, if I look at what, uh, you saw in in the hunting grounds. If I go back and look at the Jameis Winston uh, case, uh, the institution kept him from even talking to the police. And when they did, from what I remember, uh, it was sort of like, give us your autograph. You know, we would like your autograph and and laughing and joking about this serious matter. So it, it wasn't taken serious. Um, and that's the kind of culture that exists both at the uh, collegiate level and also in professional sports. Um, athletes, uh, institutions, athletic departments, um, the teams, these billion dollar teams, uh, in professional sports, um, they sort of make the rules. And the rest of society either attempts to change them or go along with them. And it's constant, constant, constant. Yes, so you're right. Thank you for that really uh, terse, but very detailed description of, of the culture, right? Um, but you have uh, worked with a team to create a really powerful tool of accountability, right? The gender-based violence in sports database. Um, what can you tell us about uh, what folks will find when they access this database? And yes, we will be sharing the link. Um, what information does it provide and why is this really important in interrupting that culture? It's important to have this database. We, we, we often tell people that we used in some way uh, the model of the databases, for example, the, um, the registry for exonerations at the University of Michigan, a masterful uh, database that allows researchers to get as much information as they need about people who have been uh, incarcerated, even though they didn't commit the crime and often spend 15, 30, 40 years in prison 
and then are exonerated. So that database is is wonderful for that purpose. Um, exonerations have increased, which is which is sad, not good news. Um, simply meaning that innocent people are spending time in prison for something they didn't do. And we looked at the database for gun violence. Um, the Washington Post has one. There's a, there's a private uh, database of all this gun violence that takes place in, in our society. And so our database, we, we were doing some research back in 2000. And um, it was hit or miss. Um, we saw cases, uh, USA Today, for example, for a long time, had one I what we thought was one of the best sports pages out there for a mm -hmm. newspaper. Um, so we picked we I'm picked up, the, screen, we picked up the the information from news sources from from you know major sports magazines like Sports Illustrated, uh, Associated Press. Uh, we have a methodology for. Um, confirming that these cases actually took place, um, you know, not false reports, et cetera. Uh, and we've built it and almost every sport, you can see from some of these icons, almost every sport is represented in this database. So it started back around 2000, published an article or two, and then for some reason, let it go. And a couple of years ago, we came back to it, and it is a very systematic uh, database on athletes who commit gender-based violence, sexual violence, rape. Um, and when you click on the uh, icon, you get the name of the person, you get their sport, um, you get a little summary of what, what the case is. Uh, the database can tell you if the case was closed or if it's still open. Exactly. Uh, there's, and you know, who the victims were, um, et cetera. There's a lot of information. And we think any researcher who's interested in the topics can at least start there, have that information, and then move out into the research world uh, and conduct their research. One of our team members um, who is doing uh, the lead in, in keeping the database up to date is writing her dissertation on, on this, which, which would be the first dissertation. And we also have two papers circulating at um, uh, sport journals, peer-reviewed journals, on uh, some of the information we gathered out of the database. So this, is, this is the first place where folks can actually see kind of the scope of the problem. And they can oh. see how it's affecting, you know, it's it's athletes, it's coaches, it's staff, it's across sport. Trainers, um, uh, all the ones that hit the national news are in there. And then there's cases that you would never know about uh, unless you were interested in the topic. Um, it's, you have to touch it almost every day because it's almost every day that we keep, keep getting new new cases. We have we have a team of about five people, uh, a couple of undergraduate students, graduate students, and and two faculty members, and um, it's I mean it's powerful, and very ugly as well. Um, we have lots of serial uh, perpetrators, and when you go back to the uh, question of culture, you say how did these people keep doing what they were doing when other people knew? what they were doing. And so we keep returning to the issue of accountability. You know, if this person was running the 100 yard dash in nine seconds flat, if this person was hitting, you know, 50, 60 home runs a year, if this person was scoring, you know, 60 points a game in a basketball game, these are, these are athletes you want on your team. You want the best athletes on your team. What we find in, in our research is some of these best athletes are batterers. Some of these best athletes are rapists. 
uh, and they become serial uh, perpetrators because nobody holds them accountable. Yeah. So this is a, a powerful tool for doing that. Um, and I'm hoping, Dr. Smith, you can speak more about some of the root causes of violence, uh, sexual violence, gender-based violence in our culture, and also some of the, the drivers, why, why you've talked a bit about the incentives for these institutions to cover it up. Uh, but can you talk about essentially patriarchy or, or you know, what's driving it in the culture and then amplifying it in sports culture? Yeah, we think it, 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 it begins in ways that we socialize uh, boys and girls the socialization process. Um, we live in a patriarchal society. Um, we have a lot of misogyny in our society. Um, you see a lot of acting out in fourth grade, fifth grade, if not sooner, because of that socialization process. Um, I think we continue to tell uh, young girls that they are not as important as young boys. Um, lots of family, families have a lot of problems and have a lot of counseling sessions to try and make sure that they're treating their sons and daughters equally. Because the outside pressure is such that that may not be happening just inside the home. A lot of the institutions that, 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 that run our society, um, the church, religion, for example. You have a lot of interesting things inside of various uh, belief systems. Um, in government, when you start looking at how the institution, for example, Congress is, 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 is situated, uh, you see a huge imbalance in terms of the men and women who serve in this, what is supposed to be an important institution in American society. In the institution that we're in, academe, uh, great studies year in and year out keeps telling us who's, who's at the top of the institution, who runs the institution, and who's at the bottom teaching five, six courses a year um, no support system, um, not getting promoted, uh, holding the, the lowest ranks, et cetera. Uh, it tells you about who's valued in our society. And so that, that underscores, we think, what we see in gender-based violence inside the sports world, but also out. Uh, if if it's taking place in the larger society, it's also taking place in sports. And, and we often say that sports are a mirror of the larger society that we, that we live in. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised, but we are because sports is entertainment. Well, it's business. Now we, now we can even say it's business, but sports are entertainment. If, if you went to school, when I went to school, you had to take gym classes and you had to take gym classes because this was this was exercise this was supposed to keep you healthy um when we went to the uh baseball games or the football games this was entertainment if not individually family and people went and they you know they had hot dogs and popcorn um and you couldn't you couldn't earn a living doing sports but all of a sudden, and I, I don't, I don't, I'd be afraid to put a date on it, but I'd say by the time we were heading into the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, uh, you can make a living in sports. And in fact, you can make a great living in professional sports. And now in, in a collegiate sports, um, you know, with, with name, image, and likeness, NIL on the, on the rise, you can make a living in 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 a collegiate sports, which is which were supposed to be flat out amateur activities um, among men and women who just enjoyed playing the games. Now it's a business and an occupation. So times have changed, but the 
incidents of various types of violence has not changed and it's gone up. And when we when we see cases, for example, um, the Stanford swimmer, Brock Turner, when you look at the sentence that he received, it's an outrage, an absolute outrage. And then you have his father making ridiculous statements about his son's behavior. Um, so it's there that we need to pay attention. And I keep coming back to the word accountability. Colleges and universities should get out of the business of trying to adjudicate the sexual violence that takes place on their campuses. And, and I know you know this, Carolyn. Um, they're, not, they're not trained to do that. And if these are uh, crimes, which they are, then the authorities should take care of it. But, and I'm, I'm going to be careful when I say this, but when we have rules like Title IX, um, you know, which a lot of people think is just something that addresses issues in sports, but it's much larger than that. But when we have uh, rules, policies built around Title IX, I think that these colleges and universities shouldn't, shouldn't be handling sexual violence, rape cases, because they're just not trained to do that or prepared to do that. Um, so we, 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 need to, we need to make big changes there if we're gonna move forward. Well, it's interesting, right, Dr. Smith, that a lot of folks might not know that all of the campus adjudications, they're incentivized to minimize it getting out, right? Because it's reputational damage. And so basically the 30% of Americans who can afford who and are able to go to college end up having a very different justice system. So if they get caught, for example, with, you know, uh, hard drugs on campus, they're not gonna do jail time. They're not gonna be, the police aren't gonna be called. It's gonna be handled internally. And it's almost, I think it's surprising to people who don't know that about colleges, right? There is this incentive to basically minimize accountability because if you were to maximize accountability and bring in law enforcement, it would look, it, it would look, it reflect poorly on your institution. Yeah. Any, any society and any institution that uses internal forms of justice fail. The military fails. The Catholic Church fails. Uh, the prison system definitely fails. These internal systems of justice are not what they are not doing what they tell us they're supposed to do. They don't work. Um, college is a, is a big business, make a lot of money. Um, and the last thing you want to do is lose your students and, and, and your student applications because you have some big major case on campus that hits the national news. Um, you, you just don't want that. It's yeah. not good for business. Couldn't agree with you more. If we want mechanisms of accountability, they're, you know, external is a, a really basic start. Um, let's jump into some Q and A. Um, there's actually a question that ties right in with what we're talking about right now. Uh, Anonymous asks, have you seen any institutions do it right? Is there any example on the forefront of the anti-rape movement in collegiate sports uh, for other institutions to model after? I'm going to say no. I, you know, for the work that we do, um, my answer would be no. I have not seen it work. Uh, it didn't work in the Stanford case. Um, that great documentary, The Hunting Ground, shows us it didn't work at Chapel Hill. Um, some pieces work when you see those those women, for example, who uh, are featured in the hunting grounds, they're the ones that made some of that work. Um, but it wasn't the institutions themselves. Uh, when you see that young woman at Harvard uh, who, who's 
parents were just devastated the way Harvard treated them. Uh, so I can't say that I know of any model uh, that we can use to go around the country and share with different different colleges and universities. So if mm -hmm. somebody out there in the audience knows of it, I'd sure like to know. Indeed. Yeah, Carleton College, maybe University of New Hampshire, but not specifically with sports. They, they're they upheld as kind of the gold standard, but still haven't achieved their own goals. And yeah, and you're referring to Camilla, Camilla Willingham at, at Harvard Law, who was betrayed by that institution. Um, and, you know, UNC, um, Annie and Dre, uh, just... It's amazing how the you know new generation of student activists is, is forming now. A decade ago, student activists did the same thing in the early '90s, pushing just to be safe on their own campuses. Mm -hmm. And you know, it may maybe uh, universities like students to hang around for five years, five and a half years now, as opposed to four. Um, that's very deliberate. But mm -hmm. once those students move on and and new students come in, the 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 institutional history is it's lost. And so you don't have any continuity, even though we talk about, well, this is going to pass down to the next generation that comes in. It doesn't really work that way. Um, so Carlton, that's great. Uh, New Hampshire. Um, and I hope other institutions look at what, excuse me, what they're doing. But Dr. Smith, I couldn't, I mean, I just couldn't agree with you more. The answer is no, right? Nobody, nobody's got gotten there yet. And I think it's for precisely the reason that you identified earlier, which is it has to be external. There's too many perverse incentives in the institution to to make this not actually address the core problem. And Katie has a, niche, a question about that too. Um, they ask, are you aware of any research that looks at the internal processes of when an athlete is accused of gender-based violence or sexual violence? Uh, they're protected by the institutions, but has anyone looked at this maybe in the same way Title IX proceedings have been looked at? So in terms of research, have we researched how institutions cover up sexual and gender-based violence with athletes? Oh, sure. I mean, we've written about it. Um, and again, it's, it's, the, it's the issue of accountabilities. It's the issue of holding people responsible. Um, in our conference that we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had um, Hershen Khan, uh, who wrote a book on um, rape on college campuses. That That's not the title, but that was the substance of the book. And they talked about the fact that um, you know, deans, provosts, all these powerful people, uh, what they really want to happen when, when, when there's incidents on campus is to shut it down, to keep it quiet. Oftentimes students protest because you might have two days or you might have a week before the student population is informed that you may have a, a a perpetrator in your midst and the student body hasn't even been told about it. Uh, then you have these various rules um, that governs confidentiality and so on and so forth. So you just, you just don't know. Um, and you can't protect yourself. You can't be safe if you don't know what's going on. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned Carlton Carlton College in Minnesota. I I, I think that's the school you. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's in Minnesota, and back in the eighties, they had a little movement, social movement there, where some women activists um, would write on the walls. I don't know if you remember this: the names of people who have committed this violence. Um, that was back in the 80s. I can tell you in 2022, uh, some of those women uh, uh, who are now academics um, are talking about how nothing much had, had changed from the time they were trying to organize, have meetings with the dean, et cetera, who, who wouldn't meet with them. Uh, and they've picked up this issue again. So maybe why they show up 
on your list as, as a possible model is because they've picked up this issue again and are actively doing something about it. I forgot about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, what a movement. Um, and it's it, but you and I have been around long enough to know it keeps repeating, right? And students, a new generation of students discover this. And it, I just, just putting what you're saying into context, because this expert interview series is really focusing on the root causes and consequences of sexual violence. And you're making such an important point, right? Which is that it comes from the culture of patriarchy and misogyny. It starts when you're really young and socialization and the way in which we value little girls and little boys and gender non-conforming folk and how people internalize that and how people act upon that given their various roles in society. But I, I, the big takeaway for me that is, is so relevant is, um, is the fact that institutions are standing in the way of making progress, whether it's big sports, whether it's college sports, whether it's academic institutions, uh, whether it's prisons, whether it's the military, you have these institutions that are incentivized to essentially not address the issue, which is stymieing progress. Um, and you've developed this tool, right, which is going to is busting through that. And Eve has a question and also Anonymous has a question, kind of the same question uh, about this tool of accountability. The database is awesome to see and its publication is critical for understanding the breadth of oppression facing women. Have you had direct in input from victims or do you pick uh, stories up from news sources? That's the first question. And then the second one, which echoes another question, which I'll read below. Have you had any pushback from organized sports organizations? So how do you develop it? And then have you had pushback and Anonymous asked the same question. Have you received any pushback or resistance from individuals, institutions, or organizations that should be allies or claiming to fight the good fight with you? So a uh, couple of related questions there, Dr. Smith. Um, when you do this kind of work, uh, there's always pushback. Um, we were moving along uh, the avatars that you, you showed uh, were not the original. We had the original, uh, you know, snapshot uh, of the person who committed the crimes. And I mean, I like that. I actually saved the picture of that, but the legal department made us take it down. Um, even though I can tell you this athlete, that athlete, convicted. Some people have served time. I mean, everybody, for example, knows or should know who uh, Jerry Sandusky is, who was a Penn State coach for many, many, many years. Uh, so putting Jerry Sandusky's picture on the, on the uh, database shouldn't be a problem. He committed the crime. He's been sentenced to a, 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 a much, much time that he probably will never leave prison. Uh, he's harmed, I don't know, a lot of young people in that uh, Penn State community. Um, but we were told that for some reason, we could not show these actual faces. And that's when we came up with um, those avatars. Um, and, you know, some look okay, some don't look okay. Um, but yeah, we had pushback. In terms of where we get our cases, we have four or five sources that we use regularly. I think I mentioned this before. Uh, Associated Press might break a story. Then we would go and see if it's showing up in, the, in for example, the Washington Post. Um, then we might check Sports Illustrated, trying to make sure that there's three or four sources that are telling us the same thing. Um, we have a method where we hold hold the cases in in a draft folder, and as time moves on, depending on what happens to the case, we might move it up into the the live database. Um, Mel Tucker, I think his name, Mel Tucker, Michigan State University, is some big trouble as a head football coach at at Michigan State University. Um, we have his case. One of the things is that the young woman who is accusing him of a crime uh, shared with us years ago 
um, her case uh, in terms of a gang rape that took place uh, among football players. Uh, we do get cases, information from survivors as well. Um, but again, they're vetted and so forth. So we, we have a, at least four or five pieces that we go to to make sure that we can put this case up um, without you know putting up false information. I have a detailed follow-up question about that. I'm wondering, since you're checking mainstream news sources like the AP and the Washington Post, and then you're crossing it with Sports Illustrated, which is obviously a sports-specific publication, are you finding a difference in mainstream reporting of sexual violence and gender-based violence in sports versus uh, Sports Illustrated and other sports-based publications? Maybe the word uh, caution, um, you know, the someone has been accused as opposed to yeah. flat out determined that they committed the, the crime. Uh, I think the sports, um, and we get stuff from the New York Times now, sports page, the athletic, uh, they seem to be a little more cautious, yeah. not, not protecting, the person and the probability that they committed the crime, but they seem to be a little more cautious the way that these stories are written up. Maybe um, using language that minimizes the crime. Definitely, for sure. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Rebecca asks, thank you, uh, well says, thank you for your incredible work, Dr. Smith. My question is, what research do you wish existed for the fight to end sexual violence in sports that doesn't exist now? Sports organizations, both college and professional, uh, usually paid their sports writers, the reporters, to carry their story. So if the New York Yankees lost the game, uh, and it's not that way today because we have so many outlets out there, thanks to the internet and the rise of independent uh, reporting agencies, um, if the Yankees lost in 1960 or 70, uh, that person writing a story would, 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 would want you, the reader, to know that these are, the, these are the reasons we lost. Not to say that we just stunk up the game that night, but to say, well, somebody might have had a sore ankle um, and it wasn't reported on the illness report that's usually turned in before the game. Uh, so they may say, you know, somebody had an upset stomach, uh, whatever the reason. Um, you know, there's a new baby coming in the family, so this person didn't practice that during the week. So you got that kind of thing. So these reporters, and, and some people didn't know this, they were paid by the by the school or the or the institution, hockey, baseball, football, they had their own reporters telling you what happened in, in their contest. Now, today, you have, I don't know, Bleacher Report. You, 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 I mean, you have people all over X, uh, Instagram, giving you almost play-by-play. -play. Uh, they're sitting in the stands and they're telling you what's happening inning after inning. Um, so it's a little bit different now. It's not, it's not as the, the news is not as much controlled as it used to be, uh, which helps us because these people who are, you know, sports nerds, um, they're really focused on these sports. Whereas, you know, people like us, I got to go to work <laughs> tomorrow, uh, and, and, and hope that, Saturday, I don't have to cut the grass or whatever, and I can pay attention to to this to the work we're doing, you know, with with our database and our reporting. But you 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 have to have that flexibility to stay on top of something like this that that may not be your main your day job. <laughs> yeah. Along those lines of the database. Uh, what advice would you give to someone wanting to put together a similar database for assailants 
of a different institution, for example, the church, Boy Scouts, cops who've been convicted of domestic violence, et cetera? I would say when you put up the code, um, I hope some people would take a picture and, and come in and look, look at what we're doing, uh, contact us. Um, I spent a good number of years studying exonerations. And I'm telling you, uh, it was sort of like trying to study violence in sports initially. Uh, you went to the newspapers, um, you talked to people, for example, in the Innocence Project, um, and, and you got your information from, from different sources. Uh, you made donations to, for example, church-based sources. sources. Uh, you, you, you got to know the people involved. And they would give you this information. They didn't, didn't, you know, they didn't charge you for it, but you would make a donation for their cause. Um, lo and behold, uh, several people, maybe four or five, at the University of Michigan put together this database. I mean, it is it is powerful. And you can search it by, you know, the name of the person, the city the crime took place in, or the purported crime took place. Uh, you can look at the number of years that people have been sentenced. So we shaped our database uh, based around that one, the the, the gun database, uh, the police killings database that the Washington Post has. And so if you come to our database, you can search it. It's, 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 it's user-friendly. You can search it by a number of keywords, et cetera. Uh, you can search it by sport. Um, we just finished a paper on women who commit gender-based violence. Um, and you know, there's not a lot of them, but some of the some of the reasoning around why this crime exists seems to be very similar to the women that commit commit these crimes. Um, we did another paper on uh, gender-based violence in minor sports or Olympic sports. So, you know, the equestrian sports, ice skating, gymnastics. And so it didn't include, you know, football and basketball. And all of a sudden you got people involved in this same horrendous crime who play golf. I'm thinking, they're not supposed to be violent. This is a this is a, a country club sport. Mm. They're in there. So it's it's a powerful tool and it's gonna be better uh as we move along. Two people have another similar question, right? Um, Eve notes, if there's a murder on campus, the criminal justice system kicks in, doesn't it? How can Title IX essentially be fixed? And then Anonymous asks. How can the public put pressure on these institutions as outsiders to demand that they dismantle the internal justice structures so that sexual assault cases are handled instead by law enforcement? Well, whole set of issues there, but okay. Uh, some third party beyond journalistic investigations and the judicial system when there's so much money, reputation and power that they stand to lose. And similarly, importantly, how do we put pressure on all those institutions as well to change those broken systems? So great questions here. I don't think, I don't think um, individuals as third party types can put pressure on colleges and universities. They don't have any stake. The people who can put pressure on colleges and universities for the most part are the parents and the students. Otherwise, these are, how do you, call them like these are closed institutions um the i forget irving goffman named them and prisons uh you know colleges and universities they're entities unto themselves you know they can they can close the doors and still feed everybody house everybody um they don't need outside connections um a little bit different today with 
uh, like food service on college campuses, et cetera, that are outsourced, whereas previously people worked in the in the kitchens and they made the food and they served the food. That well, that that doesn't happen that way any longer. You have outside corporations that do that. Um, I would say, well, use the old fashioned boycott, but that's not going to happen. Um, I want my kids educated at the at the college and university. Other people want their kids educated there. Uh, I would think that it would never happen to my kids. That kind of thing. When when we interview people, they say, "Well, I had no idea that would happen. Um, I was promised that my my son or my daughter." Uh, what do you call it, loco parentis, um, would be taken care of in my absence. Uh, so that's a tough question to answer. Um, you say, well, the legislature. Well, legislators tell us that they cut the funding from this place and that place, but unless you're in the weeds with that uh, business, you really don't know. This is hidden business. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a department chair, a dean, and I can tell you, uh, there's this saying that it's above my pay level. Certain information does not filter down. Um, so that's a hard question to answer. If there was a murder on campus, um, University of Alabama basketball team this past season um, was doing well, well above the predictions for the team. Several players went to like a lot of these college towns have a street, a main street where they have bars and pizza shops and hamburger shops, et cetera. They went into uh, town, a uh, couple of guys on the team, superstars, um, whistling and wolf whistling at some woman and uh, demanding her phone number and whatnot. And um, Long story, but one of the players was, was told to go back to the dorm and get the other guy's gun. Brings the gun back and, and the woman was killed. I think she was pregnant and maybe her baby was saved, but it was a mess. And probably unless you were paying attention to the, to the Final Four basketball tournament, because it happened right around that time, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have known about it. And the, one of the, the players who didn't pull the trigger, but I think it was his gun, continued to play in the tournament until they were knocked out. And that's a flat out, that's a murder. It wasn't on campus, but it was in, comp, in campus vicinity. And it included scholarship players from the University of Alabama. They weren't pulled, uh, uh, from the team and told, you know, to get out of here until the so-called process ran its course. It didn't happen. Um, in New Mexico, basketball team on a bus, somebody got shot. Uh, the coaches hid the gun, uh, uh, corralled their team, and the police had to chase the bus as they were leaving town, even though they were told not to leave town until the investigation was finished. And so you had coaches hiding the weapon. Uh, so if someone was killed on campus, I, I doubt that they would try internal, um, you know, system of justice, but murders on campus are rare. Um, and murders still exist at the top of that particular list. But these institutions might do something to try to delay just or delay the process. Um, and Barry has a, a related question uh, about how the board of trustees can be influenced. Is that a lever? And I think about this for the military, for all of these oversight boards, for all of these different institutions, are they effective levers? No. And I'm, I'm going to be emphatic about that. Uh, who, are, who are boards of trustees? Graduates, by and large, of they the institutions. Are alumni, and, and especially 
if they've gone out in the world and made a whole lot of money. You know, they just don't pick people, you know, who can't make a contribution more often than not financially. Um, the word on the street is that the president uh, gets the rubber stamp from the board of trustees on many different things that take place on these campuses. Uh, I suspect any board of trustee that, and I won't name the universities where uh, I, well, where I um, met with boards of trustees at various times across the year, um, these people come in, they get dinner, um, and not just, not hamburgers either, they get dinner. Um, they have drinks. Um, it's like a little gathering. The president lays out the agenda, what needs to be signed. Um, so there, I don't see them as a force. Now, maybe at some one university, that's the case, but in general, it's not. One last question, as we're almost out of time with this incredible interview, Dr. Smith, um, what is the best way to support your work? Um, you know, be vigilant. Um, if you're interested in, in, in ending rape culture on campus, if you're interested in uh, ending gender-based violence, there's all kinds of abolitionist movements out there that, that people can participate in. Um, for sure, the researchers, um, you know, you got to push these journals. They, you know, journals sometimes say, well, this isn't a topic for us. Um, so you got to convince them that it is and it should be. Um, this is serious business. I hate it every time I hear of a, of a young woman who have been abused, who've dropped out. So-and-so dropped out. Uh, these guys, I, I hate it when I hear um, through, you know, discussions, um, please don't come forward. You don't want to ruin his career. You don't want to ruin his possibility later on in life. Um, but a lot of these women, they just, they're just throwaways. They're just thrown away. I was in a dean's office once. And a coach came in with a brown paper bag with cash money in it for this young woman to take the cash money and drop the subject. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that I witnessed this with my own two eyes. A brown paper bag loaded with cash money. Yep. So it's deep. Like I said, you know, if you can run 109 flat, uh, you're valuable. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 tough, tough business. And I would hope people here in the audience who might have an interest and in, there's 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 so many subtopics under this umbrella where you know we can do good work and we can be advocates and supporters. Um and expose these things. And I, uh, I think the way I met Caroline was maybe the credits on the hunting ground, something in there connected to the hunting ground. Um, and we need more of, of folks, you know, working with documentary filmmakers and um, making these, you know, media available and showing that we have a problem in this society. And it's just unfortunately not going away. Mm. On that note, Dr. Earl Smith, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your research, which we will post with this video. Um, thank you all for attending and hopefully you will act upon all of the incredible advice and knowledge provided by Dr. Smith today. Thank you so much. Great, be in touch. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you.